Thank you for joining us today. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this uh, presentation is brought to you by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. And my name is Eileen Burke. I am the current president of Preservation Association of Lincoln. And today we have two speakers. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we're gonna have a question and answer period at the end of the program. We have two speakers today, um, Matt Hansen and Steve Kelly. And Matt Hansen currently serves as a, as a Nebraska Capital Preservation Architect with the State of Nebraska Office of Capital Commission. Matt grew up in Lincoln and interned for Ed Zimmer in the Lincoln Lancaster County Planning Department while attending the UNL College of Architecture, where he earned a master's of architecture degree in 2000. In his role as a capital architect, Matt manages uh, projects for the Office of the Capital Commission. Matt co-authored a book titled Lincoln's Early Architecture with Ed Zimmer and Jim McKee in uh, 2014. He also wrote the National Register nomination for a robber's cave. Um, Steve Kelly, he's an architect and an engineer from Chicago, and he has devoted these two skills to the preservation of our built cultural heritage. With more than 40 years of experience, one of his most significant projects has been working on the restoration of the Capitol with the Office of the Capitol Commission. Um, the work which started in 1996 and is, continues today. He is presently the visiting scholar at the School of Architecture at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And uh, Steve is a fellow with the American Institute of Architects and the Association for Preservation Technology and the US Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Please um, welcome Matt and Steve. All right, Eileen, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, my name again is Matt Hansen. I'm the capital architect and Steve Kelly is also here, um, preservation specialist joining us from Chicago. We're gonna do the best we can. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, um, but wanna tell you a little bit about the Tower Dome repair project, uh, which we just wrapped up in January. Um, goes back a few years and so, Steve and I are gonna kind of go back and forth on this and talk about some of the different things and the work that occurred. Um, just like any project that we do at the Capitol, we don't do that work alone. It takes quite a team of people to put that together. Um, in this case, the project, um, the funding part of the project came from the citizens of Nebraska, the taxpayers and the Nebraska legislature. Um, our office, the Office of the Capitol Commission re represented the owner. Um, our lead design consultant was BBH Architecture here in Lincoln. Um, Steve was a historic preservation uh, consultant on the project. Um, the temporary inspection and uh, repairs that were done in 2019 was, were by Vertical Access, which was a specialty access company out of Ithaca, New York. Our mechanical, electrical, and plumbing consultant was Alvine Engineering in Lincoln. Uh, Roy Euchre. Uh, provided the structural uh, engineering consulting for this. And our general contractor was Mark One uh, Restoration Company from Dalton, Illinois, which was also the, um, engine, or the contractor who worked on the masonry restoration project of the Capitol back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, Apache was the scaffolding subcontractor Midland Engineering who did the Capitol roof a few years ago, provided metal fabrication. Um, Grunwald was the mechanical electric, or the mechanical engineer. And then we had some specialty consultants that assisted our office, uh, Tinius Plumbing and Greg Electric from Lincoln. We'll talk to you a little bit more about the work that they did as we get further into this. Um, as far as the work on this project goes, most of you are familiar with the tower, um, the masonry restoration project that took place in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Um, that work was completed and wrapped up uh, by about 2010. And as far as the, the work here that we're talking about today, we began to see 
evidence on the exterior of the Capitol as early as about 2016 that we had some water infiltration happening on the building. And if you look at this slide, which happens to be a, a drone um, image that was taken of the Capitol, you'll notice some areas of, of white, um, for lack of a better term, white staining that appear on the surface of the dome. Those are, those are soluble salts that have migrated to the surface of the dome tile and have dried. And that is a clear indicator that we're getting water into the um, surface of the dome underneath the tile and it's bringing those out to the surface. So when we saw that, we knew we had an issue and we started looking into um, diagnosing what the problems were and seeing about what we could do to repair that. Uh, vertical access from Ithaca, New York was brought in. They specialize in projects of this type and difficult um, access conditions like we had here. Um, they came in in the summer of 2019 and did a, a full inspection of the dome and also the, um, the tower, the exterior. We got a, a shot here of some of that rope access inspection. Um, as part of their work, Vertical Access produced a report, um, an extensive amount of photography that detailed the conditions that they observed. And then we began to plan for um, what we would need to do to remedy some of those. And I'm gonna let Steve talk just a minute about um, what some of the imaging that you're seeing on the screen here with the, the thermal imaging is all about and how that was part of the, the work. Thank you, Matt. And it's interesting to, um, I think it's important to note that we set up a, um, a command station on the fifth floor with monitors. And when Vertical Access was doing their work, they actually had cameras um, mounted to their, to their helmets. They didn't always have the cameras on, but at certain times we asked them to do that. And then they were, we were able to see the same things that they were seeing. This came into particular, this is particular when we were looking at the dome, because when we got to those areas of staining or efflorescence that Matt was talking about, we were having them pull and they were by hand, which was scary. But what you're here is we're inside the tank room, which is at the 18th level. It's in the uh, drum of the dome. The uh, on the left image, you can see those two pipes. Those are those are uh, those are pipes that are draining the gutters that are around the dome gutters, and uh, and each each gutter has one drain. And we were concerned about water leakage. And so what we're doing is we're using infrared photography or also known as thermal imaging. And um, uh, moisture can, uh, it can cause a subtle uh, difference in heat transfer um, when a wall is wet. It has to do with the fact that it's changed its insulating qualities. And so what this one person with vertical access is doing, she's using an infrared camera. And you can see the type of images that we were getting. Those blue and green areas show that the wall is a little bit wet. And ahead, I think, Matt. okay, I think it's also worth mentioning that um, as far as vertical access report, when we summarized what the uh, conditions were, the work kind of fell into a couple different categories. Number one, was water infiltration at the dome. That was the efflorescence that we were seeing. We also had water infiltration at the gutter piping, which is what uh, this image and the thermal imaging is showing. Those were concerns. And then the third item that we identified was that we had a number of stone ink falls on the face of the tower. And we're gonna talk just a little bit about what those are. Here's, these are some images that Vertical Access took during the inspection. Um, you'll recall that during the masonry project in the late 90s, early 2000s, we did masonry repairs on the full exterior of the building. And at that time, we um, identified and repaired a number of stone anchor spalls that had occurred. Everything that you're seeing in these images and everything that we did in this project has been additional stone anchor spalls that have occurred since the masonry project was completed. Um, and we're going to 
just take a little closer look at, at what causes a stone anchor spall. When the building was built, the tower was faced with limestone, and most of that limestone is approximately four inches thick. That limestone was tied back to the, the brick backup um, and the structure of the tower with galvanized steel stone anchors. Um, in the upper left hand uh, view, you can see what a full uh, stone anchor looks like. And then just to the right of that, you can see one where the end of that stone anchor has been corroded by water infiltration. And then down in the bottom, you can see two, two images of an actual stone spall that I had the contractor save just so that we could um, have this to show people and explain what was going on. Um, what happens is that water gets in that mortar joint, penetrates to the pocket where the stone anchor is on the limestone, and then it sits there and it corrodes that anchor. And it doesn't take a whole lot of expansion of that steel to put enough pressure where it just blows out the face of the limestone. Um, you know, in retrospect, we wish that when they built the building, they'd use either, you know, probably bronze straps at that time, we wouldn't be dealing with this issue, but galvanized steel was, was the common material. And so um, until we've replaced every stone anchor in the face of the tower, which is an awful lot of them, we're gonna have to continue to deal with this as an ongoing maintenance problem um, into the future. Um, here's just a couple images that show some of the repairs that were done uh, during the current project here. Um, in dealing with a stone anchor spall, you can either do a Dutchman repair where they cut out the, the section of the stone that's damaged and put in a new piece of limestone with a tight joint. The other option is to do a full stone replacement and, and full stone replacements are done in conditions where maybe the stone that has the anchor spall already had some other damage to it, maybe a crack that was epoxied or something else, some reason that we, we would decide to, rather than try to do another Dutchman repair on the same stone, we'd actually put in a new piece of limestone from the original quarry. Um, so here's a view that shows after those stone anchor spalls were repaired, you can pick them out just by kind of looking at the coloration of the stone. In a few years, this will all even out in color and you won't be able to really perceive which stones um, had repairs done to them and which ones were original still. Um, back up to the dome itself, the other concern um, that the efflorescence was showing us was that we were getting a significant amount of water infiltration into the, the dome surfaces themselves. And here's an image from vertical access uh, in the rope inspection that shows just the condition. Uh, what you're seeing in this view um, is the surface of the dome and you'll see these, what in this picture are fairly open looking joints. Those are the expansion joints that were originally designed into the dome uh, to deal with the expansion and contraction of the materials in the Nebraska weather. Um, those joints were, were filled with a sealant and periodically that sealant has to be replaced. Um, this was last done in the, during the masonry project right around 2000 and we put in brand new sealant in all these joints and you can see this picture was taken in uh, 2019. You can see what the condition of that sealant was um, in that 20 year lifespan. One of the things that we're constantly dealing with is the lifespan of sealants and with changes that the EPA has made into the chemistry of sealant, they've taken out a lot of the quote unquote nasty chemicals that have made sealant products last longer. And so today our sealants, we're lucky to get, you know, six to eight years would be a, a long life out of sealants. Um, the real, besides the chemistry changes, the other thing that really degrades sealants is exposure to ultraviolet light. One of our goals was when we did our repairs here, we, we needed to find a way to keep ultraviolet light from getting to these sealant joints. And then I'm going to let. Okay, Steve... okay, I'm 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 back. I'm sorry, I was I got disconnected. I hope everybody can hear me. And I didn't hear everything you said on that particular slide, except that um, um, I was involved in the previous work, and we specified that sealant, and we were shocked at how poorly it uh, it performed. And all of you should be as well. We're sharing this with you. 
a, a vertical access, we asked them to put up emergency repairs and we did two things. Number one, we didn't want to plug uh, of these loose tiles off the dome. And so we put these, uh, put this netting in place. The other thing is we went to all of the sealant joints, which were open, we covered them with this zip tape, which is a, which is a roofing and envelope material. And we were worried about how it was going to weather. And so, uh, so uh, give me the next slide, could you please? Yep. Um, what we did was, is we actually made a mock-up um, with some spare tiles that we had, and we put these repairs on the mock-up and we placed it outside up at the 18th level. So it was weathering just like everything else. And so when you put in an emergency repair, you always say, we're going to do it. We're going to do the real repair next year. This project was no different from any other. We had to wait two years, mostly because of the pandemic. Um, we had to take the, this panel down, and I took it to the shop of the masonry contractor, and we did some experimentation. I'd remove the zip tape. We didn't any damage. Uh, we found that it was an acrylic um, adhesive, and we were able to slowly just peel it back off of the uh, off of the tiles. We would removing a a, a, a cost sticker from uh, from a product that you just bought, but it left a residue. So we were experimenting with um, with uh, isopropyl alcohol with MEK and acetone. And um, what we we found that the MEK was the best, but in order to show everybody exactly what the results were, I took some of this um, uh, construction chalk after we did the, the removal and I sprayed it onto the onto the panel, rubbed it in place, and then then just blew it off. And it and wherever it's blue, that shows where residue was still in place. But from this, we decided that we would use MEK to do the removal. And next slide. And, uh, and that's you, Matt, go ahead. I'm just gonna back up before we leave this one and just show everybody what that zip tape looks like. That's the black material that uh, Vertical Axis installed back in the summer of 2019 when they did their inspection, just to give us, to buy us a little bit of time to get our funding in place. Steve so mentioned that uh, the COVID ec epidemic had an effect on our funding. Um, it did delay the approval of the emergency funding to get dome repairs done. That was supposed to happen in the spring of 20, spring of 20, let me think about 2020. And because of COVID, the legislature adjourned and didn't uh, get the budget bill passed until August that year. Well, that was too late to bid the work and get it underway um, that fall. And so we actually had to wait until the fall spring to bid it and start the work in the summer of 2021. So this, this flashing tape was designed to be, um, you know, hopefully about six months, but we ended up going almost two years with it in place. And fortunately it, it performed very well. Um, part of the, the cost of this project was approximately uh, 1.7, million dollars and about 40 percent of that cost was just in getting access to the work area when you're dealing with a part of the building as inaccessible as the dome is it becomes incredibly expensive and we had to come up with a scaffolding system that would allow us to get um, work uh, access up to these these parts of the building that normally you cannot easily get to so that was a big factor in this cost and and when you're spending that much money just to get access. It makes a lot of sense to do as much work as you possibly can while you have the access in place. Um, so we tried to take advantage of that and do everything that we, we could find um, that needed to be done on this part of the building while we have the scaffold in place. So they actually started the scaffold at, this is the 15th floor commonly referred to as the tank room level. And all the scaffolding rested on that level was tied into the building went up to the dome and surrounded also the sewer. Um, one of the big differences between this scaffold design and the one that was in place for the masonry project was the masonry project, we scaffolded the entire tower at the corners and we had stair systems to get up and down 
Um, we didn't have the luxury of stairs or the space for stairs on this scaffold design. And so everything was uh, ladder access. And this, this slide's not intended to give anybody vertigo, but this was kind of the conditions that we were dealing with and getting up to the work areas. You, you had a caged ladder like this, and then you get off on different levels along the way uh, to access the different work areas. Um, I wanna spend just a little bit of time talking about the dome tile itself. And I'm, on the screen, I've got an image that shows uh, the sample for approval from the architect's office uh, from 1930. And this shows what one of the original dome tiles would have looked like um, originally when they were put on the building. Now, over the years, there's been a lot of weathering that has occurred. We've, um, you know, sandblasting of the exterior happened. And so some of this, some, a lot of the gold on the dome has been lost over the years, but it's, it's actually resulted in a, a wide variety of colorations on the dome tile. Um, and it's kind of given a certain richness to the appearance. It's just not nearly as brilliant as it used to be when it was originally installed. Um, and Steve, I don't know if you'd like to speak a little bit about the, the testing of the tile that you did um, on the water absorption testing. Sure, I asked, um, I asked Matt if he would send me a, he has a few of these tiles in the archive. I asked him to send me one because I wanted to do what is called rylum tube testing. And that is you, um, you would hear a, 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 a clear plastic to a surface of the structure, you fill it full of water and you calibrate water is going in. And we found that on the ex, uh, the, the glazed portion, that it was impermeable, no water went in. And so then I went to the back side and I attached it to the back side and I found out that it too was impermeable. So these, uh, these, these are very high quality tiles and they are impermeable front and back. Which turns out to be a good thing because it, it gives us a very, uh, very durable wearing surface on the, on the surface of the dome. Um, this was another vertical axis inspection photo that showed us, um, we were, I mentioned that the seal and joints, um, the expansion joints on the dome had failed. Those were allowing water to get in um, into the substrate underneath the tile and freeze and thaw and cause delamination of the tile. Now, when I say delamination, uh, don't think that, that every tile on the dome um, was in a condition that we're showing here. This was kind of the worst case scenario where we had tile that were, were physically loose. Most of the delamination were simply cracks between the structural dome and the setting bed for the tile. And the tile weren't necessarily in danger of falling off, but but by tapping on and sounding on the tile, you could tell that there was a, a break between that assembly. Um, and those we, I'm gonna to go to the next slide and show. We did, Steve and I both did some sounding. And, oh, no. and uh, what that means is we actually physically went and tapped on every tile of the dome to determine where we had tiles that were delaminated due to this freeze thaw. And I, I prepared this graphic just to show some of the areas uh, that we identified through that sounding process. There's a 20,200 tile plus or minus the surface of the dome. So it was quite a process to go through and tap on every tile and, and figure out where we had loose ones, but we were able to do that and then outline the perimeters of uh, where we had delamination so that we knew which tiles needed to come off and be reset. And then I'm going to let Steve speak just a little bit here about the some of the crack mapping in the dome tile that we also took advantage of the access to be able to do while we were up there. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, you know, it was great that we had this drone survey and we knew we had a problem, but we really had to wait until the scaffolding was in place for us to, to diagnose just exactly how bad this problem was. And the sounding that was done with that previous image that Matt showed, it shows exactly where the delaminations were, which we found out were, were the worst in the south, which we know that's where all of the weather comes out of, and that's not surprising. The other, uh, the other, yeah, the other part, you know, go ahead and go to the next one. The other thing that we saw in the building were these what I call circumferential cracks, and those are the 
red lines that you see. And we were concerned about that because we didn't know whether that was coming up through the structural dome, whether that was just in the cladding. And so we really had to do some, uh, we had to do some digging into the archives in the next image that we see. Um, and by, by the way, these, the, from that previous image, these cracks, they were not related to a specific orientation or, uh, or, or, or sun. They weren't, they weren't, uh, they weren't related to that. And in this next image, you can see some of the archival photos. And the thing that we latched onto was this reinforcing that is in the gunite layer. And I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about this in the next image, but don't go to it yet. Um, this was laid, this was a product that was, uh, that had just recently come onto the market in the 1920s, expanded metal lath, which they were also using uh, for, for plaster work. Only this is a much heavier gauge. And this image down at the lower right that Matt was just showing you, they actually found that um, they found that in the building, and so that's part of their archives. That is the reinforcing that is in this this material. And looking at that, and looking at the upper right, and some of the other images that we were looking at, we were able to find out just exactly how big these these uh, the, these sheets were. It came in sheets. It was uh, something like two feet high, eight feet long, and they would they would tie it down. Let's go to the next image. Uh, here's a here's a section through the uh, through the dome. And you can see on the right there's a tiled dome. It's the thick part. That's the on the on the other side on the on the, oh. on, the on the right. Yeah. That's the structural dome. That is made out of Gustavino tile. And what we found is that that's in really good shape. They put in the Gustavino tile, then they put in a layer of waterproofing, coal tar and pitch. And then on top of that, they put this reinforcing and they put in a gunite layer. Gunite is a, um, is a material that's used today. It's basically concrete that you spray apply it. And uh, they had just recently developed it in the 1920s. And then on top of that, they put the tile. And so what we were seeing, those circumferential cracks were related to this reinforcing. It was basically the edges of the reinforcing and it was telescoping out through the, um, through the tile. Now that was, that, was, that's, that was a good thing that we found out because we know that we don't have a structural dome problem. We know that it's just the clad side of the dome. However, we do know, and, and also um, with most of those cracks, we don't think that they're really moving. Some of them were, but we're going to talk about that later. But anyway, that was that, that was a big aha moment for us is that we realized that we didn't have a structure here, that we just had a cladding problem. Okay, next slide. And one of the things that we always like to do with these types of projects, this is a this is a unique building. It's got unique uh, systems. And this dome is no exception. And so we like to put in mock-ups of everything. So on the right, you can see a mock-up of the lead tees, which Matt is going to talk to you at length about. But you can see these lead tees in the lower part. They, were, they had to put them in in pieces when they, on the radial part because, the, because these, uh, these radial uh, uh, joints are not a straight line. And so this was a rather tedious process. And we had to go through a couple of iterations of that before we got it to a point where we felt that it was good. In the upper part of that photograph, you can see some of that zip system tape that was being pulled off. On the left, of course, after we had done everything with the um, setting these tiles in place, we were going to put a surface grout in all of the, um, in all of the mortar joints chose two different colors of mortar surface grout, one for the dome and one for the drum. So these are just an example of some of the uh, mock-ups that we put into place. Okay, Matt, go ahead. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about how ultraviolet light is really the, the killer of sealants of any kind. And 
So that was one of our tasks when we redid the sealants. We didn't want to make the same uh, mistakes that we had made in 2000 and just put sealant straight into this joint without protecting it in some way. Um, and what we decided to do was use a technology that's been around for a while. Um, it's called a lead T, Steve mentioned, and it is literally like it sounds. It's a T-shaped extruded piece of solid lead. Um, we used some of these on parapets during the masonry project, but didn't put them on the dome. Um, we decided that, that um, when we redid our sealants now, we should try to uh, use lead T's on the dome what this does, and I, I couldn't believe my good fortune when I took this picture because it kind of almost shows you a cross section of the sealant joint repairs that we did here, but you can see there's a layer of black bond breaker tape that was put into the joint first, then they um, gunned in. We actually used a silicone sealant this time to give us longer life than the urethane sealants that we had installed in 2000. Put silicone sealant into that joint and then um, they took the lead T, which I mentioned was an extruded piece of lead. You take the long leg of the T, stick that down into your silicone sealant. Um, they also put um, silicone sealant on the back edges of the top part of the T to seal that. And then that whole thing is pressed down into the joint. And here's a picture of the lead T's uh, being installed. They actually would use a mallet with a rubber uh, tip on it and, and tap tamp that T down to make sure that we had a good seal everywhere in place. And here's kind of what the end result looks like. These were the joints uh, that were open in the vertical axis inspection. Now we've got silicone sealing in the joints and the lead T's covering them. So there's really no easy way for ultraviolet light to reach that sealant. And we're hoping that that will um, extend our life of our sealants um, far beyond the six to eight years that you normally would get. Um, we're hoping that the silicone will give us a little bit longer life and keeping the UV off of it should, should do that. It's not a replacement or a permanent fix by any means. We need to continue to be vigilant and periodically inspect the dome so that we can ensure that these joints uh, don't allow water in in the future. Um, just going to jump back a little bit and talk a little bit more about the delaminated tile that we looked at earlier. Here's a, an area where we had finished our sounding. We had tapped out and found which tiles were loose. And so our first step then was, was to take literally blue painter's tape and just outline where that delaminated area of the tiles were. And you could hear that. Um, I found one of the best things for sounding the tile was I actually took a brass, small brass rod and you could actually just gently tap that on the surface of the tile and you could hear the sound of a tile that was fully adhered and structurally sound versus one that was delaminated. You could hear the difference and that's how you could determine where your, your areas of voids were at. So we taped out the perimeters and then the contractor came in, put a piece of identification tape on each tile that would number the row and the tile number. And that ensured that when these tiles came off, and were clean, we could put them back exactly in the locations where they came off from when the tiles were reset. So the first step in doing that was to grind, uh, grind out the mortar joints very carefully so that we didn't nick the tiles or damage them in any way. Um, they would grind a, a group of tiles and then pull that section of tiles off. The tiles would then be cleaned. Um, on the left, you see a stack of tiles that have been uh, clean to remove the setting bed mortar. You'll also notice in the edge of the tiles, there's a little bit of a recessed, it's called a recessed key. It's an indentation there. Um, when that's, it's really important. And uh, so we reopened all those keys because when you set the tile, you want the mortar to squeeze into that key and that helps lock the tile in as the mortar hardens. And then on the right, you see a picture of um, some of those original tiles that have been reset are being shimmed, waiting for that setting bed mortar to um, fully cure, and then they would be grouted in between the tiles, as Steve talked about. Here's a picture of um, what happens to be one of the very last tiles going back on the dome. I mentioned that there's 20,200 tiles on the dome. We ended up removing just over a thousand of those tiles during the course of this work. So that was far beyond what we um, originally had anticipated needing to do, but 
like Steve said, until we could get up and physically sound every tile, um, all we were doing was was guessing at what kind of delamination we had, and it turned out to be much more extensive. Um, it was interesting to see, though, that the areas of delaminated tile were in close proximity or adjacent to um, some of those open expansion joints in the dome where the sealant had failed. So it was very easy to see how the water penetrating into those joints and freezing and thawing would delaminate the tile. Um, another condition that we didn't fully, um, weren't fully aware of until we got up there was where the tile dome intersects the eight buttresses that surround the building. Um, those buttresses are made out of limestone and they come up and they um, interface with the dome. Where those two materials come together, originally they put in a copper flashing, but they didn't allow a lot of space for movement. Um, the tile expands at one rate and the limestone much less so. So over the years, those two materials were kind of grating against each other and we had a lot of damage, um, some cracking. We had pieces of tile that were spalling off because of that pressure. Um, so as part of the work that we did here, we, we had the contractor come in uh, very carefully relieve about a half inch joint into the tile um, all the way around those buttresses. And then we installed the same system that we installed um, in the expansion joints of the dome where we put silicone sealant into that joint and then a lead T to cover it to protect that sealant from ultraviolet light. So that, um, that should give us um, relief from that, that interaction, that pressure on the tile in the future yeah, in those areas. And then I'm gonna let Steve speak just a little bit to uh, the regrouting of the dome. Yes, so the, the dome was uh, grouted in about 2002 and we wanted to do that again. This is a, this is a surficial grout. We didn't do any grinding. We just, we just placed it over the, uh, the existing joints and it was a, it was a mix that had, had latex in it. Um, and you can see the image on the left. They're actually putting it in with a paintbrush. And they let it set, and uh, they and they they clean off some of the residue. And then after a few days, another person would come. The, the guy on the right, he's using a sponge and water, and he's just washing the haze off of the tiles. And um, when I took this photograph, I was talking to him and I asked him how many times he has to do this water clean off. And he said it, at least four times. So they had to keep going back to this again and again and again. And it's possible that there's still a little bit of residue left, although um, it will probably be washed away in the next coming years just from, just from rainfall. Next photograph. And a couple of things that I just want to say before we leave this one was, although during the masonry project, we, we did look into re, the possibility of regrouting the dome, um, the condition of the grout was, was really in good shape. And we decided ultimately not to do that during the masonry project. So the, the grout that was between the tiles is actually, um, I th you know, we think it's probably the original grout. Um, but during this project, since we were going to be repairing so much uh, of the delaminated tile, we decided to go ahead and just do most of the, the regrouting of the dome was not, I want to be clear that we did not remove all the grout between every tile. This was more of a surface treatment to fill in any gaps or crevices in the grout and uh, just give it an even appearance. So. Steve mentioned that some of those, uh, you know, despite repeated washings, there's, there's micro pores on the surface of that tile. And some of that is going to just take time to fully weather, weather off the surface of the tile. I've had several people comment that they don't think the dome uh, is quite as brilliant as it was. And I just can only attribute that to we've had a very dry winter, not a lot of, um, of rain or snowfall. And so I think it's just going to take a little bit of time for some of that uh, haziness to fully disappear there. And then uh, Steve uh, also talked a little bit about the crack mapping. And uh, Steve, do you want to speak to some of the monitoring that we put in place for the cracks? Or we might uh, we might have lost Steve there. Um, so I'll just continue talking about this. Um, Steve mentioned some of those circumferential 
cracking that we mapped on the surface of the dome. Um, there were some down near the lower extents of the dome, close to the gutters um, that were fairly open. And we wanted to just put some things in place to ensure that we weren't having continued uh, movement on those cracks. So we installed some crack monitors. Um, these were um, put into place. We, we attached them with epoxy to the surface of the tile. And then um, what will happen is if we do get movement in this joint in the future, the next time we're able to get back up there and look at these things, we'll be able to see on the crack monitor whether or not any movement has occurred. Oh, there's Steve, uh, we lost you there for a second, but I was just trying to explain some of the monitoring that we put in place um, for the cracks, especially at the lower extents of the dome. I don't know if you had any other comments that you wanted to add about that. Oh, all right, Steve, uh, hopefully we'll get you back here. Um, I'll speak just a little bit on this slide about the Thunderbird panels below the dome. On the left, you can see the condition of what those were during the 2019 inspection. There's a sealant joint around those Thunderbird panels and that had deteriorated just like the sealant joints up at the dome over the years. This was all sealant put in in 2000 and you can see uh, the condition, all the, the surface checking and in some places total loss of that material. So when we came back in, we installed the same silicone sealant and covered that with a lead T around each of the um, eight Thunderbird panels to uh, address those conditions. And then this, uh, we've saw, we saw this cross section through the dome, but I wanna talk just a little bit about the plumbing um, issues that we dealt with. Steve showed a, a picture earlier of some of that water infiltration into the tank room around the drain lines of the gutter, the thermal imaging. This is a cross section. You can see that right here, um, these are the gutters, the copper gutters that are set into a piece of limestone on the outside of the building. And then the drain line comes down through the stone into the brick back up and into the inside of the building. Well, we, we found out by scoping the drains that we actually had some tears and some holes in the connections in this portion right here within the limestone. Now that's short of taking out a gigantic piece of stone, there's no way to get to that. So we had to get kind of creative in how to repair that in place. Um, this is what those dome gutters look like. Um, as you know, we've got peregrine falcons that, that nest at the Capitol and they like to eat their lunch up there. These frequently get plugged up with various bird parts and feathers and bones uh, from the falcons. And these strainers, which are located in the bottom of the gutters, were, were getting plugged. So we had to come up with a better way of dealing with that and being able to maintain these gutters and these strainers, which are otherwise very, very inaccessible. Here's a condition of during a rainstorm at one of the, the gutters, you can see the water coming in from that, I mentioned where the piping passes through the stone. We had some leaks. You can see that running down the walls. All of this staining on the brick is evidence of past water infiltration there. So then the question is, how do you repair a pipe that you really can't get to because it's in a piece of limestone? And there's a technology that allows you to um, insert an epoxy, a fiberglass and epoxy sleeve um, inside a pipe, and then they stick basically a balloon up inside of that and expand it into place, allow the epoxy to cure, and then you remove the balloon. And what that does is effectively it lines that inaccessible piece of pipe with an epoxy liner um, to seal off those cracks and prevent any more water infiltration. And then, so that's what you're seeing in this picture. Then down right below that is uh, we installed a copper, what we call a copper hat. It was essentially a, a copper flange that would then went down inside of this epoxy so that any water getting into the gutter wouldn't go between the pipe and the epoxy sleeve, but it would go directly into the center of the piping and down. Um, one of the things that we also did was we replaced the piping on the interior of the tank room. Here you can see where the piping comes through that piece of limestone. This is a, a lead pipe. We connected onto that. Um, this used to be all iron pipe, and we actually uh, took that out and replaced all of that with uh, PVC. Now, what you're seeing 
This gray colored material is actually Schedule 80. Most of you are familiar with the white PVC pipe that you see in homes. That's a Schedule 40. Schedule 80 is an extremely robust, very thick walled uh, material. And anytime we do piping replacement at the Capitol, we actually uh, do use Schedule 80 just for durability purposes. Now to get to these connections where we were having the leaks and where we need to install the liners, we actually created some openings in the masonry. Um, and we actually left those open, installed these copper flashing pans so that if we ever do have leaks in the future, rather than saturating our wall, we'll be able to see that, the evidence of that coming through into the pan and then uh, dripping down the wall so that we can more quickly identify those problems. And I mentioned the issues that we had with the strainers getting clogged up in the gutters, no real way to get to those. What we chose to do this time was to install new strainers down near the floor inside on the tank room. So um, the, the piping is essentially open and then it, it reaches this strainer device. Our guys can go up, remove the basket in that strainer, put in a new one and then clean out the other basket and allow um, us to collect all that debris and things that collect in the pipes much more easily than, than uh, where it was before. I'll touch just a little bit on the sewer. A lot of people are interested in, in talking about that. And we actually did some patination work on the sewer back during the tower masonry project. This project, we really didn't have um, anything in particular that we needed to address on the sewer, but while we had the scaffolding access, we went ahead and scaffolded the statue itself just to give us another chance to inspect it and see how things were doing. And it turns out that the sewer all in all was in very good shape. You'll remember during the masonry project in 2000 that um, we had a conservator come in we had a lot of unevenness in the patinas on the sewer, a lot of black streaking and things. And she installed a new um, patina over the entire surface of the statue that was quite, <coughs> excuse me, it was quite bright green at the time. And a lot of people were fairly startled, but we said, hey, just give it a little while and eventually things are gonna even out. And they, they certainly have. I did want to show a, a couple of pictures that a lot of you wouldn't normally get to see, but on the sewer, um, which uh, was sculpted by Lee Lori was designed uh, not only to be a statue, but also to be a lightning rod. And it does take uh, hits from lightning in our storms. And what you can see as you look at the top of the sewer's head, there's all these little dots. And when you look at those closely, those are actually small areas where the, uh, the superheated electricity has melted that bronze on the surface of the statue and, and resulted in these little craters that you can see everywhere. We had to be very careful during the whole time this project was going on. Anytime we had weather coming in or any chance of lightning, everybody had to get off the scaffold because we certainly didn't want to electrify the scaffold or, or get anybody hurt. Um, while we had the scaffold access to the sewer, we did some replacement of sealants at the base of the statue. And one of the things that we'd long wanted to do was um, take a look at the aviation beacon between the sower's feet. Um, that beacon was originally installed in 1937. So it came in into use a few years after the building was completed in 1934, after there was a very uh, close encounter between a United Airlines uh, flight coming into Lincoln in a, a wintertime fog in December and uh, nearly collided with the building, they decided, hey, I think we need to uh, find some way to mark this as an obstruction to aviation. So the beacon was put in at that time. Um, this fixture actually dates more likely to the late uh, 1950s. It's like a second generation, but um, periodically about every two years, we'd have to have somebody go up um, through the hatch on the sewer, climb out onto the dome and replace those incandescent light bulbs. So we were looking at, is there a way that we can um, adapt or change the fixture to an LED light source that would give us much longer life. We looked around at different fixtures that are out there for wind turbines and different things. We consulted with the FAA. Ultimately, we decided that there really wasn't anything on the market that would give us the long-term 
um, durability that we really desire to see in a, in a, on a building like this and in a fixture like this. So what we ultimately decided to do was to retrofit the fixture and uh, convert it to accept LED bulbs. So instead of two incandescent bulbs today, we've got these, they refer to as corn bulbs because all the, all the LEDs were arranged in rows, kind of like an ear of corn. Um, these bulbs are, are now in place in the fixture. And you really, unless you knew that we had done anything to the, to the light, you really wouldn't know that we'd changed from an incandescent light source to uh, an LED. And the main advantage of that, instead of changing every two years, these bulbs are rated for a life of approximately something like 10,000 hours. So it should be quite a much longer period of time before we need to go up and do any bulb changes there. Um, we also replaced the ferrous metal uh, fittings on that fixture with stainless steel to help prevent future corrosion. So that kind of brings us back to where we started. And you know what we tried to do is just summarize for you today a little bit of the scope of work um, that happened. I mentioned that we, we started the inspection by vertical axis happened in 2019. And then the actual work on the building by Mark I started in July of 2021 and we finished it up in January of 2022. <laughs> on some of that plumbing up on the tank room. So um, I think those were the main things that we wanted to hit. We're at about 49 minutes, so we've still got some time for some questions. Uh, I'm sure Steve and I would be happy to try to respond to any of those that you might have or go into any more detail on things that we talked about. Brian, do we have it? We got a few questions coming in. Sorry about that. Can you all hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, well, hey, uh, Matt and Stephen, thank you so much for that. It was really interesting. And I know a lot of people have been seeing this since uh, State Capitol is highly visible all across town and probably wondering what's going on. So thank you so much for doing that. And we appreciate it. So we got a, at least one question coming in. And if you have more questions, please put it in the chat and we will answer those uh, as quickly as we can. So one question we have, what systems did you use to keep track of the status of every gold tile on the dome? 20,000 tiles is a lot to keep track of. <laughs> um, yeah, I can certainly speak to that one. Um, well, one of the first challenges was figuring out how many tiles did we have. So rather than me literally going out every row and, and counting them, what I did was I took one zone in between the expansion joints and counted up the tiles in that section, you know, from top to bottom, and then multiplied that by 18 all the way around the dome. And that's how we came up with the 20,200. But as far as how we kept track of the ones that we were actually, the thousand plus tiles that we were actually we're moving during the course of the work. It was a fairly simple system of tracking. Um, once we had the perimeters taped out on where we needed to remove the delaminated tiles, the contractor came in and put a piece of tape on each tile. Um, and that was numbered, it had two numbers on it. Essentially the first number was the row, the second number was the tile number. And of course we photographed, You know, once all the, uh, the markings were in place, we photographed everything. And then that, that tape literally stayed on that tile through the cleaning process, through the reinstallation process, so that we can ensure we got each tile back exactly, not only in the same spot, but in the same orientation because they're, they're four by four squares. So we had to be careful to make sure that we put everything back exactly in the place. And, and it was fairly simple um, to keep track of that through that, that tagging system, but it worked very well. Um, and then once everything was, was finished and reset, they went back and removed the tape from the surface of the tile, uh, did the grouting and cleaned it off and uh, we're, we're back to where, where they should be. So um, that's, that's kind of how we handled that. Now, I, I would just like to add that when the tiles were removed from the dome, they were never removed very far from the dome. They always stayed on the scaffolding right, right below where they had been taken down. And they were cleaned there on the spot before they were put in place. So they never strayed very far from their origin. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, thank you. 
Appreciate that. Uh, another question we have, what are the dimensions of the outside dome tiles? Um, yeah, the, the, the tiles themselves are almost right at four inches by four inches height and width, and they're approximately just under an inch thick. So I, I didn't talk a lot about the gold on the surface of those, but a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of different things going around about, well, you know, is that gold leaf? What's, what's the gold on the surface of the tiles? What I can tell you is this, that they went through during original construction, a lot of testing to find the most durable application for the gold coloration on the tiles. They looked at gold leafing. Um, they actually had some tiles prepared that they set out on the exterior at the architect's office in New York. And they ran those through some, some weather testing to see how it would hold up. Turned out that gold leaf on the surface of the tiles did not hold up very well at all. And you'll notice, you know, a lot of our neighbors, uh, for example, the Iowa State Capitol in Des Moines, that's all surface gold leaf. And you'll see every well, 20 years or so, they've got to go back and reapply that to the surface. We, we were lucky for something much more durable than that. And what they ultimately settled on was to use actual gold mixed into the glazes. When the tile was fired, they actually mixed coin gold, which was an alloy of 90% gold and 10% copper, they mixed that into the glaze that was fired onto the tile and then covered by um, a surface glaze. So that, that coloration is actually locked into the surface of the tile. It's very durable and it's held up quite well um, over the years. So that's, uh, that's how the gold got onto the, the dome tiles. Um, it's not a lot of gold per tile. I, I figured out you know what it would cost and it's something to the tune today even at the price of gold of less than probably about seven dollars uh, worth of gold in every tile so they're not pure gold by any means but um they they do contain gold in the glaze thank you uh, another question at the beginning of the talk you showed a photo with long narrow windows are these from the area just under the dome they're not they are very ornate these are not seen from the ground. Yeah, let me back up and see. Is that, I'm not sure which slide they're referring to, maybe these? Yeah. Um, what you're seeing in this photo, the, uh, the vertical axis inspector here is on one corner of the tower and the windows that you're seeing um, right here are the, each side of the tower contains five we refer to them as the strip windows. These are actually top to bottom, a almost a continuous uh, window from um, the 12th floor all the way down to uh, the sixth floor of the building. So that's what you're seeing here at the very top. They do have a little bit of uh, decorative design, which you can see if you look really carefully, but normally you don't see that. So I'm hoping that those are the windows that they were asking about but those are the, uh, the strip windows on the surfaces of the face of the tower. All right, thank you. If anybody else has any more questions, we still got a little bit of time, about a minute, if you wanna ask anything. Um, do you have an estimation of how much it costs to maintain just the exterior of the capital per year? Wow, that's, that's a challenging question. I can tell you the things that are constant maintenance our sealants perpetually. There is just no end given the short life term of sealants today. It is continuous that we're trying to keep up not only with sealants on the dome, but all over the roof, um, anywhere uh, on the promenade deck, anywhere that's exposed where we've got sealant joints, it's just constant maintenance. It's hard to put a number to what that costs, but um, you know, it's, it's just, I wanna really emphasize the importance of um, continuing to fund uh, periodic inspections of the building so that we don't end up in situations where we've got um, very serious damage that we can kind of keep on top of that, especially in some of these really difficult to access areas that you can't just go out and, and, and look at easily. You know, you've got to bring in a rope access team to look at some of these really difficult parts of the building that are, that are there that need to be observed periodically. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing thing that our office deals with and uh, it's just, it needs to happen. We need to stay on top of uh, keeping up with inspections and uh, just maintaining the building 
you know, it's it's a great landmark. It's a it's an important thing for the citizens of Nebraska, and it deserves to be well cared for. Exactly. Um, well, it's 101, and I think we've hit the end of our time. We've been here a full hour. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to thank Matt and Stephen for being here. And, uh, well, one more question. Steve, you mentioned that the Nebraska State Capitol is one of the most significant projects. Can you elaborate on this? Okay, uh, yes, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, what I said was this is one of the most significant projects in my career. Um, once one reason is because it was so large. Another is because I'm continuing to work on it even to this day. Um, and, uh, and number three, I really like the people that I work with in, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska. So this has been a really wonderful project for me to be involved in. It's one of the projects of my career. Great, yeah, and it's a huge project, and I'm sure one that constantly needs to be uh, looked at. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up. We've hit our one o'clock time. It's now one o two. So, Matt, Stephen, thank you so much for putting this on today. We really appreciate it, and I want to thank everybody on behalf of the Preservation Association of Lincoln for uh, attending this webinar today. So, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.